let me start with this uh, story this morning. I thought this was kind of interesting. Two Spanish con men attempted to sell a forged Goya painting, but it backfired spectacularly after the client, supposedly a rich Arab sheik, paid them in counterfeit banknotes worth 1.7 million Swiss francs, approximately 1.9 million U.S. dollars. The middleman who had brokered the deal then vanished with the only genuine money in the affair, over $363,000. Finally, the two con men themselves were arrested. The two men found out that the 1.7 million Swiss francs were counterfeit when they attempted to deposit them in a bank in Geneva. They were then detained by French customs who discovered the fake Swiss francs in their suitcase and informed the Spanish Authority. So that's what you get when two con men try to pull off a business deal. <laughs> and, uh, and it's kind of odd because it's like they got arrested for the wrong crime almost. It's like that wasn't what they did. They, they stole the painting. So anyway, or forged them. Uh, pretty fascinating story. But I was thinking about that when I was thinking about this question that we want to start with this morning. And uh, here we are. It's this question. The biggest lie you were ever told. What's the biggest lie you were ever told? Not, not that you told, but that you were told. And as parents, we can immediately go in our memory banks and we can think through, but maybe it was something that you were told, you know, by a boss or uh, maybe it was a lie by a politician. They're good at that, right? What's the biggest lie that you were ever told in life? I wonder if you can think of something, if something comes to mind. Well, let me tell you something about this biggest lie that you have been told. Let me tell you this. B- basically, um, the biggest lie that I was told was the biggest lie you were told. How about that? In fact, look at it this way. Think about this. There are 66 books in the Bible, 1,189 chapters, and 31,102 verses in the Bible. And here is the 60 uh, and 61st verses in the Bible. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of It, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And right there is the biggest lie ever told. Told to you, told to me, told to everybody. We've been told some whoppers in life. Nothing's bigger than this lie. And what's fascinating about this lie here is that what happens immediately after is Adam and Eve cover themselves and run from God and hide in the woods, signifying that immediately they knew, hey, that was a lie and it carried serious consequences. And so the irony of that is that Satan has been propagating this same lie for the last 6,000 years. And we keep falling for it. We live in a world of people who have fallen for this lie and their, their lives are empty and hopeless and they're searching for meaning. We found that meaning, but we still at times succumb to this lie. And what is the lie that he tells? Really, what is the lie? Well, the, the biggest lie that you were ever told, of course, was told by the biggest liar, Satan. So just know that. The biggest liar... That makes sense, told the biggest lie ever. And we've been reeling from that now for 6,000 years, and today we keep falling for it. And here's the biggest lie, really, is that you don't need God, and you can be your own God. That's what he told Adam and Eve. It's like, well, you can be like God. You can even be your own God. You don't need that guy. He comes down in the garden every day and walks with you and wastes your time, and you can do life without him. That was the biggest lie. And immediately they realize, hey, that's a lie and there are serious consequences. And the reality is, instead of being like God, they are no longer like God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Immediately they lost the glory of God. They knew something serious happened. This was a real oops moment for them. And yet God, and yet Satan keeps propagating this lie to us and we keep falling for it. In this series, we defined worship in a couple of ways, right? One is reflecting the glory of God, which when they sinned, the glory of God left them. So that was kind of hard to do. It's like, you know, but God, God worked on that. God, God gives us an avenue to still reflect his glory. But the other way we defined it was finding your value, worth, and strength in Christ. Basically saying, yes, I need you. My value, my worth, and my strength is wrapped up in you. It's in meeting you in the garden every day and walking in harmony with you. It's walking through life with you. I need you in every circumstance and situation. And that's how we defined worship in this series. And of course, that's the reality. We need Christ and Christ alone. We don't need ourselves. We don't need our accomplishments. We don't need our possessions. We don't need the opinions of others. We don't need what culture tells us. We need Christ. He's enough. He's enough. 
We have, as I said, two messages left in this series. Then sings my soul. Finding our song in every season of life where we're looking at worship as a response. Then sings my soul. Today we're going to get a glimpse behind the curtain in Revelations and see a great picture of worship and we can respond to this. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful uh, vision that we see from John here. But we're going to see today the intersection of worth and worship. How these two, kind of, these two ideas come together. Worth and worship. How worth, this idea of worth, drives this idea of worship. And so, again, Revelations 4 and 5, an extravagant vision of worship as we get a glimpse behind the curtain. I shared this illustration earlier, maybe in one of my little text message updates one time. Any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. I mean, that's true. I mean, what are you going to do in heaven? But 24-7, you're going to worship God. It's just, it's going to be pure, unadulterated worship. God is going to remove all the distractions. He's going to remove, he's going to remove temptation and sin, and the flesh and Satan, everything. We're going to find out that the, the thing we wanted most in life, like I think a lot of times today people think worship is kind of like boring maybe. And pe- some people are going to die and go to heaven and they're saved. They just think worship is boring. They're going to go to heaven and realize, wow, where have you been all my life? That's what I was looking for. I never knew worship. I never thought that being so consumed with Christ, with the Lion of Judah and the Lamb that was slain, I never knew being so consumed with Him would be so powerful. So today in Revelations 4 and 5, we're going to get a broader perspective and learn some fundamentals about our worship, fundamental truths about our worship, three fundamental truths. And yes, we're going to go through chapters 4 and 5, and we're going to read 4, and we're going to get one big point out of it, Kind of break it down a little bit. Try to get the imagery of chapter 4. It's only 11 verses. And then we're going to go to chapter 5. It's 14 verses. And get the imagery out of that. And break that down. And we'll see two points there. And let's start here. After this I looked and behold. Here's John writing. A door standing open in heaven. And, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. We sang that this morning, didn't we? And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will they existed and were created. Powerful, powerful imagery, a powerful vision. Let me give you today's big idea. And then we're going to start unpacking this. Today's big idea. Heaven is the only place where the king makes the throne. The throne doesn't make the king. Just let that sink in. That's, you know, every week I'm praying, Lord, I need a big idea to, to, to just kind of capture the message. And I thought, wow, that, that, that's, that could, we could just go home right now. That just says it all. This state summarizes all of our worship and all of human history, and it summarizes what we will see this morning as we walk through Revelations 4 and 5. Heaven is the only place where the king makes the throne. The throne does not make the king. Let me take you to one specific verse we're going to hone in on today. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And three things there, we're going to turn this into three simple points of an outline. The glory, the honor, and the thanks. 
three fundamental truths about our worship this morning that are just going to be so simple and so profound at the same time. Number one, the glory. The glory is this, is that Christ is not worthy because he was slain. He was slain because he is worthy. And I've said that before many times. I've used that phrase many times, but today it just fit into this message as our first point. Christ is not worthy because he was slain. He was slain because he is worthy. He alone is worthy. Worthy are you, O Lord, and God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. See, understand this, that the cross did not make Christ into something more than he is. It revealed who he always was. So here we go, two things, just two things to know about this fact of the worthiness of Christ. There was only one who was worthy to sit on heaven's throne. At once I was in the spirit, behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Only one person could sit on the throne. Only one was worthy to sit on the throne. Remember how the whole story of the Bible begins, right? Satan wanted what? To sit on God's throne. God said, you can't. No one is worthy to sit on that throne but me. He wasn't being arrogant or... He was just being truthful. No one was worthy to sit on that throne. Satan wanted to, and that's where all the problems come from. Let's walk through this real quickly here. What are some things about this throne? Verse 4, every other throne is subservient to his throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Just a picture of the authority that God is supposed to have. Going back to the Garden of Eden, there was a tree that said, I am the authority. Now there's a throne that says, I'm the authority, I'm the I'm the throne of all thrones. Every other throne revolves around me. How about verse three? His throne is marked by by God's promises and faithfulness. I thought this was fascinating. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And I thought, isn't that odd that God would take of all things a a rainbow and put it over his throne? Now we understand the rainbow, right? It's a signal of God's promises. It's a specific promise to never flood the earth again with rain. But think about this. Why did the rain come? Why do storms come? Because of what? Because of the curse of sin on the world. The curse of sin on the world is what brings about, you know, the storms and the rains. And it's like the the beauty. Here's the thing about about a rainbow. People love to post pictures of rainbow on social media, right? Facebook and that. And they post these beautiful pictures. Have you ever seen anybody post a picture of an ugly rainbow? No. That don't happen. Every, it's like, wow, what a rainbow. And what's always amazing is what's so beautiful about a rainbow is that after a heavy rain or a hard storm, here comes this beautiful rainbow that says, I am faithful, I have a promise that I'll never flood the earth again. And, and, and that promise is really just symbolic of God's eternal faithfulness because the Bible says God cannot lie, that God will keep all of his promises. So it's just an, an amazing thing. But here is this beautiful, his throne is marked by his promises and his faithfulness and as a second as a side note it's you know it's it's interesting that god's great promise today has become a symbol for man's sinful pride it's certainly not by accident this is clearly the work of satan as he lies to this world seeks social destruction and deliberately defaces god's the symbol of god's greatest promise that's not a that's not by accident satan did that deliberately he took god's greatest symbol of his promises and his faithfulness outside of the cross and tried to deface it verse 9 his throne is eternal the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever this means only the eternal one only the ancient of days and the everlasting one has the right to sit on this throne no one else can it's true that we are eternal now but we were not always eternal there is only one there is only one think about this there is only one who has truly always been who has no beginning or ending there's there is only one who has truly always been with no beginning and no ending and only he is worthy of this throne down in verse 8 his throne is marked by spontaneous worship holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come and in this vision it implies that day and night they keep singing this over and over and over i don't know what that looks like this is a symbolic vision we'll see some of that in a minute but The reality is we're told to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean I'm on my knees 24 hours a day with my eyes closed praying to God. So I don't know what this looks like. 
Just that there's this spontaneous worship, there's this attitude, this spirit, this, this ambiance of worship that just consumes heaven. Verse 11, his throne is for the creator of everything. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created and Jesus Christ is the creator and he's also the sustainer of all things. This is his throne. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Note that all thrones are under his authority. They were all created by him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together or all things consist. He is the creator and he is the sustainer and there is no one else worthy to sit on this throne. Does that make this big idea just a little more, uh, make a little more sense? Heaven is the only place where the king makes the throne. The throne does not make the king. There have been many thrones throughout history. The man who was raised to sit on such a throne, then bore a title, was given authority and had power, but it was always the throne that made the king. In heaven's case, the king makes and defines the throne. So Christ, think about it, Christ is not worthy because he was slain. He was slain because he is worthy. He alone is worthy to sit on this throne, but he alone also, there was only one who was worthy to defeat sin's cross. There was only one who was worthy to hang on that cross. Only one could sit on this throne. No one else could sit on that throne and only one could hang on sin's cross. Christ alone was the only one who could do that. 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He He is the lamb of God without a mark on him. He is the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. 1 John 3, 5, you know that He appeared, Christ appeared, in order to to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. Now here's the thing, when you think think about the worthiness of Christ, right, to defeat defeat sin's cross and to hang on the cross, it's not just His sinlessness, it's also His righteousness. He alone is sinless, but He alone is righteous, because here's the deal, the one that hangs on sin's cross and, and dies has to then be able to what? Rise out of the grave. And when He rises out of the grave, what does He do? He rises in you and me and gives us His life. He gives us His righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we all know this for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. He was sinless. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He was sinless, but he was also righteous. And when he came out of that grave, when he was raised in you and me, he gave us his righteousness, his holiness, his purity, his worthiness. What an amazing thing. There's a popular question. You maybe have heard this before, right? Maybe you see it on social media. Maybe you were asked it in school. If you, could go out to, if you could go out to dinner with one person in history, who would you go out to dinner with? And somebody might say Abraham Lincoln. Somebody else might say Thomas Edison. Somebody else might Rosa Parks. Who you pick somebody out of history and say, I'd love to go and just, just sit down and have dinner with them. Let me, let me, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, there you go. You, you like fish, there you go. Fish meal. But here's the thing, let me, let me free rephrase that question for us this morning. How about this? If you could adopt anyone's character from throughout history, whose character would you choose to adopt? You could, have, you, could have, you could have Washington's character or Lincoln's character or you name it. Anybody's character. Mother Teresa's character. You could have anybody's character. Whose would you adopt? How about this? Would, would you not choose the most disciplined person ever? The most trustworthy person ever? The most committed person ever? The most patient person ever? The kindest, gentlest, humblest, wisest person ever? And I'm, of course, describing Jesus. If I could trade and have anybody else's character, I would take his character in a, in a moment. Oops, he already gave it to me. He did. I just got to learn to walk in the Spirit. I got to learn to develop his character in my life. He's given it to me. That's the point is this, there is only one who was worthy to go to the cross and be slain. And that's Christ. He wasn't, he's not worthy because he was slain. He was slain because he is worthy. Heaven is the only place where the king makes the throne. The throne doesn't make the king. And there's this throne in heaven and Christ sits on it and he defines that throne and only he can sit on that throne and only he could go to that cross. 
Let's go to chapter five. Look at a second fundamental truth here about our worship. Revelations 5.1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back. And here's the idea I want you to get. To get. What you're reading here, John's trying to do two things. He's trying to take some heavenly realities and put them in earthly language. That's kind of tough. And then the other thing he's doing is he's just giving us a symbolic picture. This vision is, is primarily symbolic. We know that from right here. How do we know that from this verse? Then I saw in the right hand of him, so there's somebody on the throne, the father, and, and the son's going to the father and taking this out of his right hand. Well, we know, right? John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Or Colossians 1, 15, he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. God is a spirit. He's not visible. The Holy Spirit is invisible. Whenever you see the Godhead, you're seeing the second of the Godhead. You're seeing the Son of God or Christ. So this is clearly not literal. This is symbolic. And he takes this out of the hand of the Father, the scroll. So let's read through chapter 5. With that in mind, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, on the front and back of the scroll, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the, all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy! are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders uh, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I didn't use that verse because there's like seven, seven points in it, so that would have been too long. But. but verse 13, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in the, them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the living creature said, Amen, and the, and the elders fell down. And worshipped. Number two, honor. Because he is the lamb that was slain, he is the only one worthy to open the scroll. There's this scroll, and we'll look at it here, and only one has the honor to open that scroll. That's the one, the lamb that was slain. Pretty powerful. Now that, that brings us to really the big question. This interesting shift takes place here. And the biggest question we have hopefully you have, that I had, that I've never really addressed before in my years of studying. And I don't study a lot in Revelations, I guess. But here's the deal, I guess, really. What is the significance of the scroll? What's on this scroll? I don't think I ever really asked myself that. I think in my, just in my kind of, uh, without much thinking, just reading through that, I always thought, well, it's probably, the, probably your name and my name, you know, the names of the, of the believers or whatever. And that's, but we're in the book of life. And there's other books. And there's, there's the book of life and the other books and it's different from the scroll. And I've done a study on the books of life before, or that book of life before. We've talked about that in the past. This is different than the scroll. So here's the reality. While scholars admit there are several theories as to what could be on this scroll, they all acknowledge most of them are really pretty futile and they're not, there's not much scriptural evidence for those theories. We're not going to get into all those wild possibilities today, but here's the deal. What is written on the scroll that is of such significance? Let's look at it from what we know from the narrative. Let's follow the narrative through and see if we can conclude what this scroll might 
contained. So we're just going to walk right through this here. The angel's question, first part of the narrative. The angel has a question. Who is worthy to open, to break the seals and open this scroll so we can see what's on it? And of course, we could look at this question and say, is this an honest question? Is this an open challenge? Like, who can do it? Is this a rhetorical response? Because he knows who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. Second part of the narrative is John's weeping. So John now is just visibly shaken and weeping because no one has stepped up to say, hey, I'll open, I'll break the seals and open the scroll. And it could be John's just an honest question here that he's just like, oh, no one can, no one, an an, an honest question looking for an honest answer. And John's like, nobody can. And it upsets him. It could be as well that John's like, I can't even open it. And I want to open it, but I can't open it. I'm not even worthy to open it. The, the thing is, the, this, whatever's on this scroll is, is looking forward, not, not looking back. It's not dealing with something that's presumed settled because John wouldn't be so upset. It's looking something in the future. There's something on this scroll that has to do with the future and John wants to know what it is. No one can seem to open it. Then we have the line of the tribe of Judah. Really, we have the, the elder that comes and consoles John. And he says, John, Don't worry, John, don't weep. Why? Because the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And he is able to break the seals and open the scroll. There's someone who is worthy to do that. There's someone that can do that. It gives us the idea that the scroll was maybe held in some kind of limbo, like maybe the scroll is kind of like the spoils of a war. And the lion of the tribe of Judah conquered in this war, and he now has the right and the authority to break the seals and open the scroll which takes us to the next thing. It's really fascinating. So John then is looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah and here comes one that looks like the lamb that was slain. This is all symbolic. It's kind of an odd, yes, it's an odd kind of vision. And so this gives us some idea that the lamb that was slain is the one, something, opening these scrolls has something to do with the redemptive work of the lamb that was slain. Because he went to the cross, because he did something, he has the right, the authority now. It's like the lion won this this war, but the lamb did something on the cross. This lamb has seven horns, which, which represents his power, has seven eyes, which represents his omniscience and wisdom. He is the all seeing, he is all knowing, he is all powerful. Do you get how this brings about a sense of spontaneous worship? Like, holy, holy, holy! Like, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor and glory and power and blessing. So in this vision, the lion that looks like the lamb takes the scroll because he is worthy and able to break the seals and open the scroll, which again tells us something about this scroll. It's something to do with the redemptive work of Christ. Then we have this. We have the prayers of the saints. I always read this and I thought, I always just generally said, you know, God's collecting all our prayers and they're in a bowl up there and, and what does that mean? I don't know. I think these prayers of, of the saints here have something to do with the scroll have something to do with their heart for this like john for this scroll to be open for the seals to be broken i think that's what these prayers of the saints are golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints i think these are very specific prayers in this bowl and it takes us to the end really the worship that proceeds out of this worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for god from every tribe and language and people and nation and we'll get into more of that song in just a moment but here's the deal it leaves us what is on this scroll what do you think is on this scroll what did christ do with his redemptive work let me give you one other passage here about his redemptive work romans 8 it gives you a little more of the all-encompassing nature of what christ did on the cross yeah he redeemed you and me but what did he do paul writes us for i consider that the sufferings of this present time maybe the sufferings that, that the saints went through the prayers of the saints as they suffered are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of god for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of god for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now 
and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. What's on these scrolls? The judgment, the hope, the inheritance, the redemption, God's promises and plans for all of eternity. Everything looking forward, everything God's going to do, everything we've been, we, and think about today. When you think about the prayers of the saints today, right? Think about what we want in life. Here's what most resonated with me as I studied this out and then what most scholars seem to agree with, really. Most of my assumptions and conclusions were pretty much what the scholars all seem to say. And it fits the overall narrative here that this scroll lays out the future and eternal plans of God. The judgment on the wicked, the hope of the redeemed, the inheritance of the saints, and all of God's promises and plans for all of eternity. One bit, of, one bit of useful commentary came from Barnes. There have been no more earnest efforts made by people than those which have been made to read the sacred, or to, re, to read the scaled volume which contains the record of what is yet to come. By dreams and omens and auguries and astrology and the flight of birds and necromancy, people have sought anxiously to ascertain what is to be hereafter. We all want to know what the future holds. There is a scroll that tells you God's future plans all the way to the end. And they're on this scroll. And only one is worthy to open that scroll and to let us know what the future, what the future holds. And again, I was saying this goes back to the prayers of the saints. Think about the prayers of the saints. Think of what the ultimate prayer is today for the redeemed, right? What is our prayer today as the redeemed? What do we want more than anything? We want God's plan to unfold, his justice to rule, our eternal hope to be realized. We want things to be made right. We want that lie that Satan told to be revealed to the whole world and things to be made right on the earth. That's our prayer. The truth is everyone today living has a bit of dissatisfaction, right? In this world. Those that don't know Christ have lives that are empty and they're full of hopelessness and despair and they're dissatisfied and either they won't admit it Or if they will admit it, they just won't admit what they need. They don't know why they're dissatisfied. You and I who are believers, there's a bit of dissatisfaction among us as believers, right? We want to go to glory. We want God's eternal plans to be unfolded. We want justice to rule. We want judgment to fall. We want our hope to come. We want things to be made right. We simply know why we're dissatisfied and what we're looking for. So I think these prayers of the saints, they're more specific prayers and they undergird what's on this scroll. The prayers are in essence for the scroll to be open and its contents to be realized. So here's the question, really. Were God's eternal plans of judgment, justice, and hope, were they ever in danger of not being realized? Were they? How about this verse? Remember this verse? All who dwell on the earth will worship him, Satan whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. We talked about that in one of our recent series, right? God finished before he started. The Lamb was slain before God did anything on this earth. No, his plans were never in doubt of coming to fruition. It's it's not that. We can't let John's weeping shake our faith and think, oh, maybe something wouldn't have happened. No, it was going to happen. John just didn't realize. John just didn't understand that God would control that God was in control and that his plans would prevail. All this tells us is that God's plans will un, un, unfold at a specified time. When the time is right, the Lamb is going to break the seals, open the scrolls, and God's eternal plan is going to show out. What this does give us, though, there's a beautiful application here that develops out of this near, a, beaut- a beautiful application that flows out of the transparency of John as he weeps. And it's simply this. God turns our mourning into dancing. God turns our mourning into dancing. In fact, the reality is this is a symbolic vision. And in some senses, John's weeping may be a picture of what our weeping today. Do we not weep over the world today? Do we not weep over the state of things today? Do we not look at the destruction and the devastation and the hopelessness and the lostness and, 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 and the, the, the impact of sin in the world today? And do we not weep and long for eternity? And yet God turns our mourning. He turns our mourning into dancing 
In fact, you know, here, here's what happens, right? Let me tell you what happens. What was, the first, what was the first biggest lie ever told? You don't need God. You can be your own God. Adam and Eve, they buy into that lie, right? What do they immediately do? They run, they cover themselves and run and hide in the woods. Why? Because what's the second biggest lie? It's all hopeless. There's no hope. You blew it. It's over. And the lamb that was slain says, no, no. God's got an eternal plan for the redeemed and there is certainly hope. Certainly hope. And every day we have hope. We don't have to run and we don't have to hide. We don't have to run. We don't have to. That brings us to the, the third fundamental truth today and it's found in Revelations 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and praise to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Here's the reality. The one who is worthy of worship is the one who has made us worthy to worship. Amen? You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. We talked about this well back in Sunday school that there's this idea of being the priest to God. There's a literal interpretation there. There's, there's a literal kingdom of Jewish people. Like if you, you want to understand it, there were 12 tribes in the Jewish nation and one of those tribes were the Levites and they were like the ministerial tribe. You know, they offered the sacrifices and led the worship and there were one tribe out of 12. And then in eternity... There's all these nations and tribes in the world, all these Gentile nations, and there's one nation, the Jewish people, that they will serve as the ministerial priests, and they'll, I don't know what their job will necessarily do, but they'll lead the worship and whatever sacrifice, whatever that looks like in eternity, how we honor that, I, I don't know. But, but the reality is they will lead the, the ministerial worship for everyone in eternity. That's their role. So we're not literally priests, but in a sense we are priests. Let me show you how. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. We are now a temple. The Holy Spirit has made his residency in us. He tabernacles now in us. So we are the temple of God. Of course, the priests were the ones who operated in the temple, were they not? We are the temple of God. And then look at this verse, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so we also, we're the temple of God, and we are a living sacrifice for God. I'm supposed to present my body to God as a living sacrifice. I can do that. Why? Because I am holy and spotless, because he made me, right? He made me holy he made me worthy he made me a worthy sacrifice and so i am the living sacrifice and who offers that sacrifice well i guess we could say in a sense i'm a priest that offers my own sacrifice i'm not the literal priests of eternity but we are symbolically a temple a sacrifice and a priest before god offering our lives to him every single day and I've never really thought about it in that sense before. And the point of all this is that the one who is worthy of worship is the one who makes us worthy to worship. Let me give you a couple of closing applications. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Jesus did this, right? Jesus was born sinless and holy and he lived a sinless and holy life. He walked worthy of his calling so he could go to the cross and give his life for you and me. But we're called to live in a life worthy of the calling. Here's another verse similar, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. We've, I've done an entire series on this a couple of times, this idea of worthiness where there is something over here and then to walk worthy is there is something on the scale that balances that out. You put the scriptures over there and what does it look like in my life when, it, when it's equal, of equal value in my life? What do the scriptures look like? What does the gospel look like? Be worthy of the gospel. What does that look like in my life? In Christ, I have the life of Christ. He lives in me. What does that look like? How does that balanced out in my life? 
How can I this week walk worthy of Christ's life, which is my life? You see, he makes me worthy so that I can then live worthy. So when it tells us here to walk worthy of your calling, realize you can only do that because he made you worthy. He made you worthy. Now because of this, another application, because of this, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, right? Do you ever think about this? When you come boldly before the throne of grace with your requests, with your needs, with your heavy heart, did you know to come boldly before the throne of grace is an act of worship? Did you, did you ever think about that? That when I come boldly before the throne of grace with my request, with my need, saying, Lord, I just need, that's an act of worship. And because what is worship? Finding my value, my worth, and my strength in Christ. When I come to Christ and I say, Lord, I am just, I, mean, I, I don't have any strength. I, I, can't, I can't do it. That's an act of worship to come and say, Lord, I need you. And this is, a, this is an advantage that we have today as believers to come boldly before the throne of grace. You realize unbelievers can't come boldly before the throne of grace. Now, can, can unbelievers pray to God? I think they can. We, we sometimes have these things that we believe that I don't know if they're scriptural, like when you pray, you got to close your eyes. Well, that's not really in the Bible. Doesn't say it in the Bible. And, and I think in, like in the Old Testament, anybody could talk to God in the Old Testament, you know, you could cry out to God. I think anybody can cry out to God and he'll listen to them, he'll hear them. Especially if they're crying out for salvation, then he of course hears them. But they can't come boldly before the throne of grace. You know why an unbeliever can't come boldly before the throne of grace? Everything about this? We, we mentioned it earlier in the series. Where's the throne of grace? Where did God establish his throne in my life? right here my heart i'm a temple my heart is where he put down his throne when i go to the throne of grace i'm going right this is how close this is how near god is i come to god and i say lord i need you and god's like i'm right here we come boldly before the throne of grace and it's an act of worship to do that it's an act of worship to do that so what did we learn today? I got one last application, but let's... Heaven is the only place where the king makes the throne. The throne doesn't make the king. And the glory is that Christ is not worthy because he was slain. He was slain because he is worthy. He is worth all the glory. The honor is because he is the lamb that was slain. He is the only one worthy to open the scrolls. Give him the honor because he went to the cross and did what only he could have done. And he has the authority to do what we've been praying for him to do all along and finally the thanks is yes the one who is worthy of worship has made us worthy to worship let me give you this last application true worship is the king makes the man the man does not make the king just just how do you hear that this morning i don't know but just know this the king makes the man he makes us as he said back in revelation speaking literally of the jewish people but symbolically of us he makes them a kingdom and priests to God. He makes us worthy so that we can worship him. The king makes the man. The man doesn't make the king. And we like to, right, we like to make God to be what we want him to be, right? Like, and, and I'll, give you a very, I'll give you a very blatant one that we, most of us can, can relate to and then realize that we do this in our own subtle ways. We don't realize it. Those that take the rainbow, right? Christians that take the rainbow flag and the pride movement and say, that's okay with God. They're fashioning the king in their image. The king's not fashioning them in, their, in his. And we can, we can look at that one and say, yeah, but let me, we all do this. Where do we do it in our life? Where do we come along and, and we want God to be what we think he is? We want to fashion God in our image and rather than the king making us into his. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that there is a throne that has your name on it. There is a throne that you define that throne. You're the ultimate authority. There's an authority we can go to. And there is one who went to the cross and who has the right to break the seals and open the scrolls and usher in the eternal plans that we just cannot wait for, that we long for, that we like creation in Romans 8. We just, oh, we groan until that day and oh what a day it will be in glory when we gather in your presence 
We long for that day. We give you praise and honor and thanks today that you are the lamb who was worthy, the lamb that was slain. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're gonna close with a song today. Thank you.